Um, so this is about uh, origami design. Actually, I work on two or three, maybe three or four topics. And um, so whenever I give a lecture, I give people the opportunity to choose the topic. And over the last five years, everybody chooses origami. I only speak about origami. <laughs> so, um, and part of the reason for the interest in origami is, um, is, the, is because it's a nice visual su subject, um, but also because uh, many, many other reasons, aesthetic reasons, of course, is a traditional uh, reason. Um, another reason is uh, world population is growing. So people live in smaller spaces. And uh, so if you have your small one room apartment on, in, in Köln on, on the river, then you uh, maybe you want to have a canoe or a, or a sailboat. And the people now make uh, canoes that fold up into a small space. So you can and certainly having a canoe in full size canoe in your apartment may not be so nice. <laughs> So uh, that's the space saving aspect of origami design. So um, the work I'm gonna describe is, um, here are my sponsors, by the way, but uh, Juan Liu, she, she uh, contributed a huge amount to, to what I'll say. And uh, almost all the pictures, including this one are due to her, but also the, um, she contributed significantly to the proofs of the theorems and so forth. Um, I won't present all the theorems um, in detail because some of the proofs are kind of boring, um, but um, the statements are clear. And uh, and if you, this, everything is, nearly everything is in this paper. Um, so if you want a copy of this paper, I can also send it to you. It should be, it's not actually a preprint, but it will be soon, very soon. Okay, um, and we're going to be doing a uh, curved tile origami. So, uh, you know, the uh, deformed shape of the origami after it's folded, the tiles will be curved isometrically. Um, and that's, um, whereas piecewise linear origami is an old subject and it's been worked on a huge amount. Um, people in mathematics work on it, people in engineering, people in computer science work on it. Um, when it's curved tile, it's almost nothing is, been done. So it's a nice, that's also a nice opportunity for mathematical analysis is the, the curve tile case. And there's a good reasons to look at curve tiles and I'll describe those reasons. Okay, so um, obviously when you do curve tile origami, differential geometry is gonna play a role because we're gonna think of the tiles as thin sheets. And so naturally you think of uh, these can undergo or only undergo isometric mappings. And uh, so then you're into differential geometry. And, um, you know, usually people in differential geometry think of, uh, uh, you know, of objects. The objects you want to study are independent of the parameterization. That's the whole philosophy of differential geometry is, uh, is intrinsic objects like curvature. And uh, this, if you think of it in terms of folding, in origami, that's that leads to an Eulerian approach. In other words, you're you're looking at the deformed configuration or the deformed configuration of the embedding. If you think in those terms, and uh, and that's the the case of of origami in general is um, in one of the one of the proponents and one of the most famous, probably the most famous person who does origami as Robert J. Lang. I was, I was on a project with him for five years, so I got to know him quite well. And, um, and his, his way of doing origami is you, you have the flat sheet of paper and you, you fold it and you're, you're, you're sort of halfway folded and you identify um, quantity, kinematic quantities in this deformed configuration and you build your theory based on that. So, okay, so you have, some lengths, you have some angles in this partly folded origami, you, you find relationships between them. That's that's standard. That's that's the almost all all of his books, certainly, and uh, and uh, that's the main approach. Um, we're not going to do that. We're going to do a Lagrangian approach. So we're gonna we're gonna consider the mapping, which takes you from the flat sheet to the deformed sheet. And almost everything I'll show you will be deformable from the flat sheet by piecewise isometric mapping. Um, and there's a few papers that take that viewpoint, but um, you know, as they say, 99% of the origami community uh, do not. Um, 
you know, so um, when you do curved tile work, so this will be the main kind of open problem of my lectures is that when you do a curved tile origami, you have origami uh, mappings. But um, if you were doing piecewise linear origami, you would have tiles and maybe they're, you know, in the reference state, they're flat, flat tiles, like polygonal tiles, if you want. And then they they become deformed. Of course, they're they're stable configurations, and you know it's a stable state. So that it, you know when you no matter how you make your origami structure, it's a if, it, if it's a zero energy state to begin with, it's a zero energy in the folded state as well. As well. On the other hand, when you make curved tile origami, there's an underlying energy minimization problem. It's it's completely open. So most of what I'm going to show you, I'm not going to solve this minimization problem. I'm going to just give you shapes that are kinematically possible. We'll, just, we'll discuss this minimization problem at the end. So there's a big opportunity for mathematics in terms of posing and understanding the boundary conditions um, for well posedness of curved tile origami. It's a completely open area. I mean, most of what I'm discussing is completely open. And we're going to use a lot of group theory, this Lagrangian form formulation. Some ideas from theory of phase transformation is uh, quite nice for, carries over nice to our design. So, um, as I said, we'll do curved tiles. I'm going to give you some terminology. So the tiles, they would usually refer to, to these regions that become folded, you know, so those are the tiles. Whether it's piecewise linear or piecewise uh, um, isometric, and um, the name for the the place where we for the derivative is not continuous is the crease, and and um, yeah, and so uh, I mentioned Robert J. Lang, so I just wanted to point out that um, so this is a you know he can fold anything you want, <laughs> so you tell him a rhinoceros and he will fold you a rhinoceros, and so. That's amazing. And um, what he uses is, is quite interesting. He, he knows the math, but in folding a rhinoceros, he kind of folds the general shape of a rhinoceros, and then he introduces additional folds as he goes. So there's a, there's a part of it that's artistic, and there's a part of it that's mathematical. He knows both parts very well. So there's the crease pattern. After he gets done, then he can give you a crease pattern. But in a way, you know, if you were far from folding rhinoceros completely mathematically, so there's, as I say, there's this, there's this uh, more intuitive aspect, which is mixed in with the mathematics. The mathematics comes into the restrictions on these creases in the, in the um, unfolded state. Um, and so the terminology here, this would be called the crease pattern. So you, uh, I'm sorry, the, oh, the um, data probably, um, there's something called the mountain valley assignment, um, which is a kind of ill-defined concept as far as I'm concerned. But um, so the dashed lines, when you first start folding it, would fold up and or or I don't know, up or down, I'm, I'm not sure which, but and then the solid lines would fold down. And that's whether it folds up or down usually means in the mathematics there's a plus or minus one somewhere, and uh, you get to choose plus or minus one. And um, and that's called the mountain valley assignment. Okay. We'll be doing some mountain valley assignments. Okay, here's another another uh, aspect in, by way of introduction is uh, so this is a pattern that we came up with actually it's probably 20 years old, um, and that has uh, so that's a that's a crease pattern that can be folded. We'll see that. Um, notice that there are all four fold intersections. Creases four meet, creases meet at every point. And it gets finer and finer as you approach the boundary. And notice that the, the sum of opposite angles here equals pi. Um, and that's that's something we'll prove. We'll, uh, we'll tell you why that's true. That's, a, that's a, one of the most basic theorems in origami design is this uh, sum of opposite angles equals pi. That's true of all the intersections here. But anyway, this, this structure has the property that very easy to prove that the entire boundary goes to a point. And um, um, and uh, so theoretically, you can fold this, and then the entire boundary goes to the point to a point. Actually, it's very easy to prove that 
you take a line which is epsilon away from the boundary, and you just you just look at the um, you just look at uh, the deformation. You write the deformation gradients of all the regions. That's easy to do, and then you just uh, see see what happens to within epsilon of the boundary, and then you let epsilon go to zero, and you see that it goes to a point. Um, but this is a typical problem with origami, and we didn't know this when we came up with it, is that um, um, we don't know how to deal with self-intersections. So it could be that as you're folding this, you know, two pieces of paper come into contact and you can't go any further. So, um, and we don't know the conditions for that. Um, something is known about that in elasticity theory. You know, so for example, in elasticity theory with some assumptions on the domain, if you have um, a determinant of the deformation gradient positive and you have one-to-one -one mapping on the, and the deformation is one-to-one -one on the boundary, uh, the domain has to be nice enough and then the deformation is in some large enough Sobolev space, then you know it's one-to-one -one in the interior. But there's nothing like that known in the interior. But so you start folding and pretty soon sometimes it's two things intersect and you're stuck. Okay, so um, detecting that would be a really a nice um, uh, advance in this area. So you can see from what I'm saying here, there's a lot of open problems and they're interesting and maybe they're doable even, I'm not sure. Anyway, this guy, so anyway, I showed this to a guy, uh, physicist at Cornell, Jim Sathman, he put it in his book, it turns out. And, but then later, this guy, one of his students, showed that, uh, that there's always a self intersection. So you can't actually fold it. You fold it on the computer, but then the computer allows self intersections to go right through each other. Um, okay, so uh, you know, we're not only going to do math here, we're going to actually do origami. So, um, all right, maybe I'll let the people in the first row do some if they want. Um, I'll do some up here. So this is the uh, this is to get you started. This is the most basic. Uh, I don't have enough paper to go around for everybody, but uh, this is the most basic origami uh, uh, And uh, so what I'm going to do? What's what's really interesting about this is, you know, I could I could draw some very precise lines on this piece of paper, like like that picture. I can show you it's folded. But what's much more interesting to do is to take the piece of paper, just crumple it up, and then push it down onto the table and push it down onto the flat region. You know, so and now you, you open it up. You open it up, and here's what you're going to see is some patterns. Um, the nice patterns there. There's uh, there's one there, um, and it, what you what you very often see if you didn't make it too complicated, um, this one there, where four four creases come together, and so like that, four creases come together, and um, the interesting thing is if you get a protractor, I don't know. We're in the math institute, but I don't know if there's a protractor at uh, HIM. Anyway, if you get a protractor, you measure the angles. You'll see that, that to one or two degrees, even though you didn't do any special preparation, to, to one or two degrees, the sum of opposite angles will be high. So the angle in region one um, plus the angle in region three will, will equal pi to, to one or two degrees. Okay. So that's uh, quite interesting because we didn't actually you know, they inscribed special things. We just pushed it down into a flat. That shows, that shows how much um, paper wants to, to have theta plus C equals pi. Okay, so now we're going to prove theta plus C equals pi. Um, and um, let's see. Yeah, so uh, when we pushed it down, when I pushed the, the piece of paper down onto the board, of course, when it was deformed, and I'll try to re reconstruct how it was deformed. You know, some some pieces of some pieces of paper were rotated, 
and and other the pieces of paper that were not rotated were flipped over and possibly rotated. Okay. So um, the 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 deformation gradient would then be in O2. Um, so the, the pieces of paper that, that just rotated would, would have gradient in SO2. The pieces of paper, the, the, the parts of the paper that got flipped over and rotated it would be in O2 takeaway SO2. Okay. So, um, and I would, we're saying O2 because we're mapping, I'm neglecting the, the thickness of the piece of paper. So we're starting in O2 and ending in O2. And um, the paper is not stretching. So the only thing it can do is uh, have gradient in, 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 in O2. So then, uh, then, we have, then we have the problem. Of, so I'm gonna, you know, it's, it's nice, I like this picture here. So imagine this part of the board is, is, all, is all two by two matrices. Okay? So R4. And um, and O2 consists of two components, as you know, it consists of SO2 and SO2 times any matrix, orthogonal matrix with determinant minus one. So this is matrices with determinant plus one. I'll draw that as a circle. So this is um, SO2. And then there's another circle, which is, um, which is, um, SO2, we could write it SO2 times any, any orthogonal matrix with determinant minus one. So if you want, you could, you could write it as minus one, zero, zero, one. Okay, so that's, a, and obviously they, they don't intersect. And so, um, so if we want to describe, now I'm gonna take as, as, as the reference configuration, the unfolded sheet, and then the deformed configuration is the folded sheet. Both of them lie in the plane. Okay, so we're going from R2 to R2. And uh, as I said, the gradient should be should be in SO2 and um, or, or should be in O2. And so the gradient is supported on, on these two circles. That's the hypothesis. Okay. So um, now the gradient on a on a, on a say on a nice open subset of the piece of paper, the gradient cannot be supported on just SO2 unless it's constant. That's Liouville's theorem. Um, so, so, so we cannot have, we cannot have a gradient which is a pure rotation. Okay? Um, so, so we can't, you know, I can't put all the, all the gradients I see here, I have to put some of them here and some of them over there. And, um, and, um, so let's imagine that I have, I take this four-fold intersection that we, we noticed, or at least I noticed on a piece of paper, and I just label the regions one, two, three, four, like in this uh, picture up here. And, um, and since we, and let's suppose the, the deformation gradient is R1 on region one, and uh, um, then, you know, if we on region two, when I can't put I can't put uh, I can't put uh, anything else from SO two. I have to put something in in SO in the second circle SO two times minus point zero zero one. So I have to alternate back and forth between these two, and um, and so then where can I put these gradients? That's the question. Um, and um, so <clears throat> so I'm looking for for you know, matrices R1, Q2, R3, Q4. R1 and R3 are on SO2, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna alternate between those as I go around um, in this domain. So for example, you know, I could have R1 is here, let's say. And now, you know, I, I could, as I say, I cannot have, I can't, uh, in region two, I can't, I, I can't put anything else on SO2 because that would violate the units here. But I could have something else over here. And that's, uh, so I say it's Q2. But then the, then the point is the, the region with R1 and Q2 would have to be compatible. So I have something like this. I have, um, you know, my piece of paper. Um, 
you know, let's just take two regions. So, you know, we have the gradient of y is what did I say? R1 here, and it's Q2 there. And R1 is in SO2, and Q2 is in SO2 times plus 1, 0, 0, 1. But if y is a continuous function, and it has these gradients, uh, then a necessary and sufficient condition that, that such a function exists is that the, the gradients have to differ by a rank one matrix, okay? So uh, Q2 minus R1 has to be rank one, and that would be necessary and sufficient that there's a continuous function Y with, with this properties. So now you come to the algebra problem. You're sitting here at R1. Um, there's, there's no other matrix over here, which differs from our own by a rank one matrix. And then there's which matrices over here differ from R1 by a rank one. That's a little algebra calculation, the two by two matrices. Um, so what's the answer? It turns out every matrix over here differs from, from R1 by, by, uh, by a uh, rank one matrix. So you give me any matrix over here, Q, Q minus R1 is rank one, okay? That's just uh, that's just algebra. So now now we can solve the problem. So the uh, the actual equations are there. Uh, see them. I wrote them. Okay, very good. Okay, so here's the game. So I, I could make a little uh, notation here. I could say if two matrices differ by a rank one matrix, so A and B. Then I'll draw a line between them. Okay. So this, this is a notation for B minus A is A and so A. Okay, so, so now we solve the problem. Now we can solve the problem. Um, so I, I'm sitting here in region one, and I'm, I want to tell you what the deformation gradient is in region two. So it's got a lie over here, but any matrix works. Well, I choose one. So Q2 is over here. Uh, and these differ by a rank one matrix, so I'll draw a line between them. Now, um, now I'm at Q2 and I, I'm thinking about region three. And so I can, when I get to three, I can any matrix over here because they all differ by rank one. So I take a matrix over here. That's uh, R2, or R3, I guess is my notation. And, um, and then I, then, I, then I'm sitting here at R3, I'm, I'm starting to think about root region four. And uh, so which matrices differ from R3 by rank one? Anyone, so there's anyone over here. This is Q4 in my notation. Then I can draw a line between them because they differ by rank one. And then I'm back to four and one. And, uh, and, and, and of course, R1 and R4, Q4 do differ by rank one matrix, so I can draw a line between them. I'm done. Okay, I solved the problem. You just write, figure out what those, you take those matrices. You know, so, so why is it that sum of opposite angles is pi? <laughs> it's because, um, it's because, uh, It's because um, there could be geometric restrictions. In other words, you know, one kind of geometric restriction is you could sum sum these four equations, and the uh, U2s cancel, and the R3s cancel, and the U4s cancel, and the R1s cancel. So there's some restriction on the, the normals n. Oh, by the way, the normals are here. So those are the rank one matrix has to have uh, the, the second vector has to be the normal. So um, there could be geometric restrictions, and there are geometric restrictions on the on the ends. And you, so there's a little calculation that I won't present, but you you work with these four equations. You try to first you eliminate these, then you try to eliminate the a's. You find the restrictions on the ends. The answer is theta plus b equals pi. So necessary and sufficient conditions that. This, this structure is flat foldable where theta plus b is equals pi. And as I said, if you do that with a piece of paper, you'll see that uh, that's accurately satisfied. So what oh, happens if there is no form? So that's a good, very good question. Yeah, so um, of course, odd read, you know, you couldn't have three. 
because you would you would go here, here, and here, but then then you would finally move those there. So you have to have an even number of regions. And uh, if you had so when you could have six regions, you could have eight regions, and then the, and then the answer is necessary and sufficient conditions is the sum of every other angle to this pi. <laughs> that's the that's the answer. Yes. So they're all possible, and you might find a, a six-fold region on your piece of paper. Oh, you have a very nice one there. <laughs> well, that's a four-fold, but it's a, it's a very nice one, yeah. Yeah, you can, yeah, yeah, right. Um, okay, so that's, um, that's, uh, that's a standard thing, but we were just dealing with a, a deformation which takes the unfolded sheet than a completely flat folded sheet. And what we would really like if we're going to design origami, we would like a homotopy. We would like to bring this into three dimensions, fold it continuously, and at the end have this uh, have the solution we already have. So now we'll we'll describe how we build the homotopy. Um, so let's suppose that we want it, we want to have a full homotopy that takes flat to flat. So we will assume Theta plus phi equals pi, and there's theta and there's phi. So we'll assume the necessary and sufficient conditions for a flat foldability that we found already. And um, and now, how do we build the deformation? Um, first of all, there's no additional conditions that are needed, so we, that's this will this will always be possible. Um, and it goes like this. So. <clears throat> um, and you can think, so these matrices, these, these R's, they will be, you can think of them if you want as what um, three by two matrices, or you can think of them as three by three matrices and then have a zero in the last column of X. Maybe people usually like to think of them in the second thing. So anyway, so let's, let's think of these R's as uh, members of SO3. Okay. And we'll think of X as a vector in, X, in SO3, which happens to lie in a plane. That's the, that's the reference configuration omega. So the omega is in R2, but we'll think of it as embedded in R3, and, and then we can deal with SO3. Okay, so here's how it goes. Um, so I want to <clears throat> I want to describe all about the SO3. So I'm going to this into R3, keeping compatibility at those, at those four interfaces. And so let's let um, T1, T2, T3, T4 be the normals, uh, not the normals, but the tangents, the creases. And, um, and without loss of generality, we, could, we can fix one of the regions. Now that's, uh, that region is uh, between N2 and N1. So that's this bottom region here. That's uh, the region of this first uh, entry. And we'll fix it, you know, fix y of x. So this region will, will remain fixed and all the rest of it will fold itself around, around this region. And, okay, that's possible because we can always rigidly rotate the whole thing as, in any way as we fold it. So y of x equals x uh, on this region. <laughs> now, we can easily arrange um, uh, the information gradient to this region, which is compatible with y of x equals x on this, on this line P2. In fact, it's uh, necessary and sufficient conditions. We can use R2x. And my notation here is R2 has axis T2. So R2 T2 is T2. And uh, eta is the angle. So, uh, Think of the axis and the angle way of thinking of a rotation matrix, and eta is the angle in R2. So this is R2 is a rotation with axis P2 angle eta. But you can see that by this, by this, by this function, th this function agrees with this function at T2 because R2 T2 equals T2. So, so this 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 clearly agrees with that and at x. Put the origin at this uh, center at, uh, at T2. And now you can easily build the deformation for this region three, which agrees with this deformation along the line perpendicular to N3. Again, the origin is at the center. So that's 
is it? And we have some freedom. We're gonna we're gonna allow, although the axis will be this T3 of R3, um, the angle can be anything, so we'll call it XC. Um, and you can see immediately that this function agrees with this function at uh, on T3 because you can just cancel with the R2s and R3 T3 equals T3. Okay, so clearly this function agrees with this function along this line. Now we come to this line, we, 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 use, we use the deformation gradient R2, R3, R4, we, we, we introduce angles eta, C, omega, and we can see that this function agrees with this function along this line, because of course, if we put T4 in there, we have R4, T4, T4, and we just cancel the two and three. Everybody okay with that? Or very basic calculation. Uh, so that's, we're done. We, we have perfect compatibility of these. This is a continuous deformation on this region we, we showed, where we're already up to four, we're up to here. Now, the only, the only thing is now four and one, but it's not, the same argument does not work with four and one. So we have to ma match this deformation with this deformation along the line with that is that has that's parallel to T1. Okay, so that's R2, R3, R4 with these three different angles, T1 is T1. You just play with this algebra, you find that eta, you find a relation between eta and omega. Eta is plus or minus omega. Um, like this. And then you can also show there's a there's there's a function that is not so easy to write down, but there's a, a functional relationship between C and this, this angle. So you get to play with one angle, that's the omega, and you have plus or minus. Okay, so there's two ways, if you want, there are two ways to go from this, you know, isometrically, piecewise isometrically to the flat sheet. Um, and, um, and, and then, yeah, as omega, as omega goes from minus from, from zero to two pi or zero to pi, zero to pi, then, um, and this is uh, describes a folding path that goes from the flat sheet to the folding path. Okay. Um, so it's, it's there. You can draw. You can make you know, lots of nice movies of this uh, of this homotopy. And a lot of uh, origami structures are simply based on putting these things together. Well, I've got some that I can show you later. Good. Okay. Um, so now here's a here's an example. From these by linear origami, and what this what I'm heading for is is a motivation. It's our original motivation for looking for curved tile origami. Why 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 is curved tile origami? Um, yes, I was thinking yeah. about that previous. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was expecting the compatibility to be depend, you know the, the last angle of rotation would depend on the previous two, but only if it depends on one of them. So yes, that's right. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, it's it's. It's some crazy algebra with this this expression. Um, you put um, it's because maybe uh, is that related to the previous sort of issue of uh, interwoven pairs. Um, yeah, I, I I'm not sure, but anyway, it's it's a rigorous argument, and you you write this down. You you actually put the R two on the right with transpose, and um, you dot with the right things and. Uh, you dot with T3 then, and uh, that will get rid of the R3. And uh, so the C is gone. And then if you see that, that's, that's maybe the main thing. Put the R3, R2 on the right with transpose. So you have R3, R4, T1 is R2 transpose T1. And then dot with T3. And then move R3 onto the T3. It has a transpose, but you think that could get rid of the R3. And then you really, then you really have a relation between omega and eta. That's, that's how it goes. Yeah. Okay. Um, now here's an interesting thing. This is the this is our main motivation for studying curved tile origami. Is uh, so this is a this is a crease pattern, a trivial crease pattern. But I'm just wrapping representing the topology of the crease pattern by this picture. So. All I mean by this picture, I don't mean that, that none of the angles have to be 90 degrees here. Um, it just means there's a fourfold intersection. Okay, so it's this, this picture represents the topology of a certain folding 
pattern that I'll tell you, going to tell you. And um, of course, it has all fourfold intersections, so it's all it's all re you know related to this. And uh, of course, um, you know, there's uh, sum of opposite angles is pi has to be satisfied. Blah blah blah. You know, and, and so you start working that out. You start here, you know, and you start working this this one out, and you find your three parameters, and then you realize you have the deformation gradients now given here, and they have to feed into this calculation and so forth. I'll spare you the details. Um, and, um, and you find the following result. You find the result that if you give these angles, as I said, these angles don't have to be 90 degrees, but if you give these angles along here, these angles, and also you give the angles up here along this edge, and then at each at each one of these nodes along here, so I'm just talking about this edge and this edge. At each node along these along this edge, you're allowed to choose plus or minus one. Okay? So there's also a choice of plus or minus. They're independent. You can you, every every one you, you get to choose a plus or minus one. So in summary, you get to choose the angles along here, the angles along here, and a plus or minus one for each of these intersections going on. And then you can show that you, that you can continue, um, you know, these are all fourfold intersections here. So you can continue using the results that I just had. And you can, you can find the angles at, at every one of these nodes. And the only obstruction is that um, it can happen that, that, um, um, that, um, uh, an interior angle between neighboring three that the neighboring creases become zero and pi, and then you can't continue. So it could happen that you you can't continue, you know. So um, and uh, but anyway, if if you can continue, then then assignment of these angles, assignment of a plus or minus one at all these nodes on the edge, gives you a unique pattern, and uh, you can write it down explicitly. Okay. So actually, I, I don't know the when I saw this, it was actually uh, Paul Plachinski did the main main work about this. When I when we were doing this, and um, for me it was it's it reminds me a lot of I don't know if you know in hyperbolic differential equations there's something called the Gorsop problem. You give you give data along it's in the x d plane. You give data just like this, and then you follow characteristics and you solve the hyperbolic differential equation. Linear hyperbolic differential, and um, it has a lot of the character of that. But I don't know if there's some mapping between this. Anyway, this is an example of a, once you do that, this is an example of a solution. So, um, so these angles have been chosen. So, so this this can be folded. In fact, it can be folded flat. Um, and uh, in many cases, it does not have self-intersection, so it's quite interesting. But I haven't said everything. It can be folded flat in many ways because I, I've just given the angles along this edge and the angles along this edge. But I also said that you have to get to choose plus or minus one at every one of these points. When you choose plus, plus or minus one in different, by the way, the plus or minus one corresponds to this mountain valley assignment. Uh, at the, at these at these uh, creases, right? That come out to this edge. That corresponds to this uh, whether they whether they fold whether they fold up or they fold down. Yeah. But anyway, it's just a plus or minus one you get to assign at every node on this edge, and a plus or minus one you get to assign on every node in, on, along this edge. So you assign those, and you get some structures. I mean, uh, depending. So all of these structures have the same crease pattern. They just have different choices of those plus or minus ones on the edge. Um, and you say so you can get all kinds of nice structures. But but the interesting thing is that um, if you figure out, which is an easy thing, how many how many different ways you are to fold this, it is 65,534 ways to fold this. This is nearly two to the 16th power. And uh, I guess this six was the 16. Uh, eight and eight, or I, I can't remember. But anyway, it's and, and that's not exactly two to the sixteenth because we pointed out here 
blah, blah, blah. <laughs> anyway, um, and that's a typical thing in origami design is just lots of ways to fold. I mean, the recreational designers love this because uh, it's just a huge number of ways to, to do folding. But if you're folding for a given purpose, maybe it's not so good. So from our perspective, um, you know, there's too many, there's too many ways to fold. And maybe a good thing is we should study isometric origami with not piecewise linear origami because it adds elastic energy to the structure. Okay? So that's uh, that's one of our main motivations. And I'll show you an example. So here's here's another example. Here's a very famous example. You know, if you know Frank Gehry buildings, um, of which this is this is an example. Walt Disney Cotton Ball. He uses uh, piecewise linear origami. But it's not foldable from a flat state. So this is uh, these are these are, and we'll tell you there's a theorem later later in in my talk. Hopefully in this talk I see I see I see Xavier was right. I mean we have um, time goes fast. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, so I cannot I cannot um, unfold this flat. Okay, if I unfold this flat, I have to I have to I can cut it here. And, and unfold it so that each each side is flat. But they in the reference domain, the, the, the this curve will go into two different curves. Okay, that's uh, that's that's the way it is. Um, but it's very nice, a uh, very nice example of uh, non-flat foldable uh, origami. And um, and of course the, the elastic energy that's built into the structure is really used in the in the in this application because. Uh, it helps hold the thing up. Um, so, and there's just great flexibility. You know, different tiles can have uh, the, uh, <clears throat> we're going to discuss near the end of my lectures, um, uh, Kirchhoff's plane theory, which is sort of ideal theory for calculating the energy of such structures. And um, according to Kirchhoff's plane theory, um, the energy of, of, a, of a curved, isometrically curved tile goes as the thickness to cubed. So that's a strong dependence. You double the thickness and you get eight times the, the um, um, stiffness, you know. So um, it's uh, by varying the stiffness, uh, you, can, you can do a lot for design. Um, and not only that, the tie, you, can, you can vary the thickness on an individual tile and it will still be isometric bounding. So it will still be a good approximation of isometric. So, um, um, and in any case, in, in, in these lectures that I'll give, it's everything will be foldable from a flat state. It won't be like this. So, you know, the reason that, that you know, the designers associated with Frank Gehry buildings and not, uh, and Frank Gehry himself, <laughs> don't care whether it's flat foldable, is, is you're not gonna carry this whole thing flat on the, on the back of a truck, you know, so. On the other hand, um, you know, each if you if you cut it here, and I think that was assembled. At least we have a Frank Gehry building on the campus of the University of Minnesota, so I could see one up close. And this is joined here in the back. You don't see it by, by some other structure. And um, but the fact that each one is isometric is very important, of course, because they transported the the structure there on the back of a truck, and you like to have things flat when you transport. It. And then you don't care so much. You're not going to transport the whole thing on the back of the truck. So you don't care the whole if the whole thing is flat folded. Okay, so uh, a little bit more terminology. Um, so we're going to have a reference domain since we're taking this Lagrangian uh, viewpoint. Uh, we're going to have a, a reference domain, which is called Omega typically in a deformed configuration like this. Um, we'll call these tiles, just like in the usual case. Um, and this, this, you know, this will be the, we'll call this the deformed crease. This will be the reference crease. And so there's a piecewise isometric mapping illustrated here, which takes one into the other. Um, and so there's, the, I'm just uh, trying to tell you the terminology. And I, I guess as many people would know here that if you have an isometric mapping, and then you, you look at the deformed configuration. You can do this with a piece of paper. 
you take any point on the deformed configuration and you turn the paper in the right way, then you can straight, see a straight line through that point. That's the ruling. And um, so there are rulings here and uh, there are rulings here as well. So the white lines are the rulings in, for these two surfaces. And um, if you take the inverse image of the rulings, you get rulings back in the reference domain. So we'll be using those as well. So there are rulings in the reference configuration and there are rulings in the deformed configuration with the ones in the deformed configuration having the usual meaning of rulings. Um, now rulings are, are very nice. They're also uh, a disaster. <laughs> Um, so these are some, this, this, this figure is from this paper by Sir and Martels and Peter Harnett. And, um, and the problem, you know, if you write a paper on isometric mappings, the problem, of, you know, for the first 20 pages is to try to describe the rulings if the domain is not convenient. It's, it's, it's a huge mess. So, um, so these are some rulings, you know, from this paper and, and these, uh, these regions, these blue regions are also a mess. That's the re regions that become flat after deformation. We wanna make some organic structures. We don't, we don't want to have to write, you know, deal with such situations. So first of all, we're gonna focus on sufficient conditions, not necessary conditions for an origami design. So we're not gonna to try to deal with this. And, and, and the fact is, if we're gonna be using it to build in elastic energy, why do we need these blue regions anyway? So they have zero elastic energy. So um, we'll do that. Okay. Now, um, okay. so I guess uh, so. I have three theorems that we use um, in, in for origami design, and we'll go through those theorems. Um, and time wise, okay, maybe we'll do the first theorem and, and, and just stop. Okay. So in this theorem, we're going to. Uh, so the things, they differ on what's given. And uh, we use all three of them in different ways. But um, in this case, we're going to be given the reference domain and, and with the reference crease and the, and the reference rulings. Okay? And then we're going to predict um, the deformed crease. From, from this information, we're going to predict the deformed crease and the deformed rulings. And the deformed rulings are going to be and it's going to be an iso piecewise, pairwise, you could say, isometric mappings, which uh, would uh, take the reference rulings to the deformed rulings and the reference crease to the deformed crease. Okay. So the idea is to come up with an isometric mapping given only this information, reference rulings and reference crease. So here it goes. Um, we give the reference crease. So we give this angle phi of S. We give arc length parameterization. It's in the plane, so it's very simple. Formula, um, and we give the reference rulings. So we also give this to give this P of S in this theta of S. And <clears throat> what's, what's that again? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, but that, the the for the X there, the phi would be uh, would be an angle between this curve and the and the horizontal, and then. Um, of the phi, that would be the phi, and e and the theta would be the angle between, you know, um, the e one axis. So this e one axis is right there. So between the e one axis, so it'd be this angle between e one axis and the ruling. Yeah. So we get that information, and we're we're also, as I said, we're not going to deal with this microstructure of planar regions and uh, all these crazy rulings. So we're trying to. We're going to assume that the rulings do not intersect and they're transversal to the. To the curve. Um, and um, and we're, we're, we all have the freedom to give. I'm sorry, I used fee. Um, <clears throat> I used fee for this. Anyway, we're going to give a continuous function fee and, um, and solve these ordinary differential equations. With so we have the freedom here is the phi. So there's going to be a freedom to be able to assign a single angle as a function of arc length s. And um, and um, you know, so those are these are ODs for T and T curve. Um, 
they remind me of your, your, your talk. That's what I was thinking, yeah. With these cross products and so forth, there may be some connection, I don't know. Anyway, then you get a formula. So there's a, a formula you write down for the deformed uh, crease. That's great. Um, and then you can also write a formula for you, using the solution of these ODs. You can write a formula for the deformed rulings. And you can write, uh, 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 you can use parameters. S is arc length of the crease in the deformed, I'm sorry, in, in the reference domain. And V is just the parameter. So this is the this is a parametric description of the rulings in the deformed configuration. And then, of course, since the reference, the reference similar formula in the reference domain was given, then we we there's an induced mapping y hat between uh, the reference rulings and the deformed rulings. And uh, and then the conclusion of the theorem is that it's isometric. That's an isometric method. So this is a way way to uh, think, and everything's explicit. So when you have to solve ODEs, that's all. Um, so there's the deformed crease, the deformed ruling, and um, reference crease plus reference ruling. And, and there's many, uh, many because you get the choice. Um, and the, the proof of this goes, it's, as I say, I'm not going to give all the proofs, but this one is, is, is uh, simple, maybe a little bit interesting, is uh, you take those ODEs right there and you, you just dot them with various things here. And you see, you see that for these dot products, you also get a closed system of ODEs. You remove the state, you only have the theta. And so this is a system of ODEs in standard form, and you solve it with initial conditions 0, 1, 1. Um, so 0, 1, 1, you can see why that, that choice of initial conditions, it makes uh, T a unit vector and uh, it makes, um, at least initially, it makes T perp a unit vector initially and perpendicular to each other. This T is going to be the rulings in the, def define the rulings in the deformed configuration. And, um, and so you make initial condition zero, one, one for these three quantities, and then you see that, that they remain zero, one, one uh, structure of the ODs, that solves the ODs. And so, um, um, and then you define uh, you define a deformation gradient by these three equations. Uh, no, you uh, yeah. So the, the, these are to be satisfied for the deformation gradient. You define another deformation gradient by these three formulas coming from these differential equations, and then um, and then you simply observe that. F bar satisfies these these three these three equations, and um, um, so F equals F bar if if and only if um, the E and V prime minus X zero prime are linearly independent, and then um, and you find out they are except on a set of measure zero on, on a line and. Uh, so that's uh, so F in fact equals F bar with the smoothness and then and the end. Okay, now um, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna have some cases later in some of the explicit designs where the crease is ruling and it's not treated in this. So we have to we have to generalize a little bit. That's the case. So I think I'll probably stop there. Um, uh, the next case is we're, we're just going to try to give the, the, the creases in the reference domain and the deformed domain, and then try to make isometric mappings in that case. That's, so, but if, um, since I don't think I want to start because there's some, some things to explain there, and um, I'll stop there.